we have a special guest. I was about to mention that those who are in the Power BI WhatsApp and Telegram community will already know him. You know, he's one of the people who, when you ask questions and the and the question is conk, you know, it's really tough. And you just notice that there are some set of people that they are the only ones who end up being able to reply. And so he's well known in that community, and that's why we wanted to make the goodness to flow around, you know, ensure that everybody get to learn rather than just those the few of us in that community benefiting from him all of the time. So we have with us today Ephraim Ibong, and he's an experienced data analytics professional. He's a Microsoft certified trainer, and uh, he's worked in different uh, industries, you know, from telecom to e-commerce and financial services. He's passionate about data analytics, and uh, not just passionate in an abstract way, but tied to practical results, you know, delivering value through product improvement, unlocking insights for management. So these are the kind of things that, you know, you when people want to move into data analysis, this is what they say they want to be able to achieve. You know, when you are trying to bid for projects for clients from companies, these are the kind of things they want you to, to achieve for them. So we're here today, we have someone who's been doing that, and he's going to, from his wealth of knowledge, he's been generous enough to create time for us and to come teach us, you know, not just teach us something to just uh, use up the one hour, but he's particularly picked a topic that he has found that there is a gap around for many people trying to master this data analytics. So you're going to learn something relevant. You're going to learn something, hopefully, that will transform your approach to data analytics and move you to the next level in your learning and, and uh, where we are all still learning. So I don't want to assume there's anybody here who uh, should take the approach of, you know, I know it all. So when I say I know it all, like you don't want to uh, see anything as something that is going to up your learning. No, the truth is that uh, when we do things, we do it from the way we learn in the beginning and the way we've been doing it all the time. But then today, we're going to have get a fresh perspective to how we should approach things. So whether you think you've been doing this for long or you are new, uh, I want us all to see that this is a fresh insight that uh, is meant to open our eyes to something he has identified as gaps. And for those who are learning, you're in the right. I mean, those who already know that they are starting their journey this is just a session that you should not miss and for the rest of us who think we are some ways into our journey this is the time to pause and rethink and take in some new insights some fresh insights and uh, you know get strength for the journey ahead so i don't want to use up too much time you know singing his praises i want to call him off stage now so mr Ephraim, uh the stage is yours it's a pleasure to have you and we are all willing to learn from you and to gain more in our journey in data analytics. So yes, the stage is yours. I'm going to stop sharing. I will be in the chat box monitoring messages and making sure no background noise affect uh, what we are doing today. So yes, sir, the stage is yours, sir. Wow, wow. So um, thank you very much, Mr. My pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, I must say, you're kind of someone I, I really respect a lot. I mean, I think you're the champion of the Power BI WhatsApp group. I mean, so you've been someone I really respect a lot and, you know, giving this opportunity. I mean, I respect that. So thank you very much. My pleasure, it. sir. Thanks for accepting our invite. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so <clears throat> before I actually go into the major thing for today, I'm going to actually give you part of the reasons why I decided to pick this particular topic. I, I kind of interviewed um, some data analysts sometime last year. My company were looking to recruit some data analysts. And, you know, I went to LinkedIn, I asked for a couple of CVs and the likes of them. So I got some individuals and I interviewed a number of them. And, um, well, I must say, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some of them might be in this, but let me just say, I mean, I felt like a lot of people lack basics, lack fundamentals. I mean, so I noticed that they, most of them kind of lack the fundamentals of data analytics because um, I feel like the question was actually very straightforward. But 
if you don't understand certain simple things, trust me, you can achieve the very big things. So for me, there's one particular word that I live with that uh, um, leads to this vision and stand. So if you're good with the Yeah, can, can you still hear Now, yes, but I think we missed many of the things you said. So you're about to talk about that particular thing that you notice that people are missing, they on you froze. I was about to even try and get you on WhatsApp, so you might need to restart from there. <laughs> okay, so like I was saying, I mean, the question was quite um, straightforward, but because a lot of them actually lacked some fundamental knowledge, I mean, they couldn't really approach the person properly, and, and I actually thought it wise to actually just deal with this topic, which is um, the fundamentals of data analytics. So it will actually help us, because most times I've noticed a lot of us just um you know we want to delve into data analytics and we just start by learning tools you know and um trust me it's not one of the best ways to actually delve into data science through data analytics tools data analytics isn't about tools you know there are a lot of techniques there are a lot um i mean methodologies you can actually end up solving a business problem without even applying a tool at the end of the day yet so that's why i actually decided to actually pick this topic and you know deal with it so without any further ado I'd just like us to delve into, um, so I'll be sharing my screen right now. Okay, screen one, yeah. Oops, I have a lot of things here. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. All right, so this is actually just our, our title, Data Analytics Fundamentals, by my very self, Ephraim. And if you're a the A4, and if you're that. So I'm um, MCSA, MCT. Well, I can go back into that because Mr. Michael already did justice to that. So I'll just move on to our next slide. Okay, so this will be the content that we'll be dealing with for today. And that will be what is data flavors of. Before I go on, sorry, sir, um, how long do I have, please? Uh, so it's, it's for one hour. Or, you know, even if you extend it a bit, it's still okay. Okay, so I just wanted to know so that I know um, what, at what pace. Yeah. You know, sometimes when you have too much things in your head, you start to over talk and over talk. <laughs> okay, so, 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 <laughs> all right, so I have this content to actually guide me. Um, now we're starting with what is data, flavors of data, types of data analysis, importance, like some of the importance actually. And then the problem solving technique, which is like the approach, the approach rather, careers in data analytics. So we're going to be looking at careers in data analytics as well. We're going to look at the data science archetypes and then um, data analytics tools and techniques. So we're going to have a lot of questions at the end of the day. Okay, so learning objectives. Now, these are the objectives of what we intend to achieve by the end of this um, session. Now, we'll get introduced to basic concepts kind of like the fundamentals of data analytics, understand basic techniques, um, types, methodologies in data analytics problem solving, and also to understand different rules of data analytics. Okay, so, so I'll start with the first one, definition of data. This is quite um, very simple. I'm sure everybody knows this. We have all have basic uh, computer knowledge one, one way or the other. So in computing, data is information that has been translated into a form that is efficient for movement or processing. So this just basically says that data in its original state is unprocessed. So for us to be able to work with data, we have to process it into information. So data can exist in three forms. Data exists in three forms. Uh, we have the structured data, for instance, like for um, the XLS, which is the normal Microsoft Excel. We have the .csv. So Structured um, data are actually data that exist in rows and columns. So rows in the sense of observations and columns as entities. So we have structured data, and then we have semi-structured data. These ones exist partially in rows and columns. Not really in rows and columns, but they can be translated back into rows and columns as well. So we have example of them. We have the XML, and we have JSON files. And then the unstructured data are the .txt file, which are basically like books, um, you know, tweets and the likes of them, JPEG, which are images and videos as well. Okay, so 
Now, example of structured data, like if you can see in this example here, we have um, we have tables consisting of observations and entities. All right, so SQL, this example too is also from an SQL database. So you can see we have our rows and column there. So this is just uh, a simple example of a structured data set. So we look at semi-structured data set. Now we can see this structure actually, there's still a possibility for, for us to be able to convert this to tables and rows because we have certain parameters here that we could use. So if I take, for instance, but if I were a programmer, so I could say, um, okay, so help me space uh, space these things by probably um, by comma. So if I if I introduce a comma here, I can actually um, separate this by good, the operation completed successfully and the likes of it. So I can actually um, convert this also to a structured format using some mechanical approach. And same as this uh, particular, oh sorry, same as this particular um, JSON file on the right as well. So I move to the next one. We have unstructured data. So if you notice here, we have an example. We have a picture here of a cart. This is entirely unstructured. <laughs> this cannot be presented, represented in terms of rows and columns, as it is right now, actually, because this is a case of, um, so I'm not going to go deep into that. This is actually a convolutional neural network, which I used to actually um, work with computer vision and image recognition. So these are basically unstructured data. And then on the right, I have some tweets. So um, a data analyst, should data scientist could decide to um, you know, do a sentiment analysis on um, some kind of tweets. So using natural language processing, like if you notice these days um, on your computer, you try to use Google and uh, you have a mail, you have this auto reply that Google now helps you to do, which is actually natural language processing. So it kind of helps you to respond by studying, um, you know, sentiment, uh, statements and, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. And basically it applies to LinkedIn as well. If you notice on your LinkedIn, you have this automatic um, help for replying to messages. So these are just basically natural language processing, so which are unstructured data sets. So I move on to the flavors of data. Now, first and foremost, we have the quantitative data. Quantitative data deals with numbers and things that you can measure objectively. So if you have quantities that can be measured, and actually that's why they're called quantitative anyway, because they are quantities and they can be measured objectively. So for instance, we have the height, we have the width, we have uh, length, temperature, humidity, prices, and the likes of them. Now, there are two categories of quantitative data, and, we, and these are discrete and continuous data. Now, I'll start with the first one, discrete. Now, why are they discrete? They're discrete in the sense that they cannot be made more precise. For instance, like the example I have there, you cannot have 2.5 kids. You can either have one child or two kids or three kids. You can never have um, 2.5. So it cannot be um, broken down into pieces. So you can only have them in discrete values. And these are like integers, like you have them one, two, three, four, five, kind of like that. And then the next one, we have continuous data set on the other hand. Now these can be divided or reduced into final levels. Like for instance, we have centimeters, 2.5 centimeters or 3.5 millimeters and the likes of them. And these are actually data types that belong to the float category. Like I said, the discrete, um, um, data types, they, they belong to to integer, they are integers, right? Integers belong to discrete um, data types, yeah? And then for the continuous, we have the flow, we have them as a float or what we call decimals. Okay, so I move on to the next one. Uh, we have the qualitative. Now qualitative, on the other hand, um, they deal with characteristics and descriptors that cannot be easily measured. Okay, they cannot be easily measured, but it can be observed subjectively. Now, like smell, we cannot actually decide to measure. Say, ah, yeah, how how did that? How what's the measure of that smell? You know, what's the what's the measure of that taste? You can't really, you know, measure smell. You can't really measure taste, attractiveness, color. We can't measure things like that. And um, two categories of qualitative data are actually binary. Of ordered or ordinal and unordered or nominal. So I'll break them down now. Now for binary, these are like um, like the example states, um, they're one or two mutually exclusive categories. Like for instance, something can either be right or it can be wrong. It can be um, a yes or it can be a no. It can either be married or single. Okay, so like, that's like binary classifications. You can either accept or you reject. And then now for ordinal, 
which are like ordered. Like for instance, this is the kind of data set that exists in items that can be assigned to categories that do not have the same kind of implicit or natural order. For instance, if I have a basket full of uh, filled with balls of different colors, now I can. These are not ordered. So if I if I pick these particular balls at random, I cannot say which is first or which is second. Do you understand? So they are they are they are actually um, on. Oh, sorry, I was talking about. The unordered, sorry. So unordered and nominal, they are the ones that cannot be categorized or they cannot be, they, don't, they do not have a natural value or rank. Sorry, the ball example was actually for unordered and nominal data set. For the ordinal, on the other hand, they can be ranked. For instance, short, medium, tall. So I mean, there's a category for it, just like a medium of um, scale from one to 10. So it is definitely obvious that um, two would be greater than one, three would be greater than two, and 10 would be greater than nine. So that's why they are ordered because you can they can be measured in the sense that um, the the upper scale are kind of larger than the, the lower scale. So that's why they are ordered or ordinal. So I'll move on to uh, the next one. Key data analysis types. So we actually have a lot of them. We have a lot of um, data analysis types. We have the predictive analysis like we have here, which is key prescriptive analysis, descriptive. We also have the diagnostics, we have the inferential analytics, we have the um, causal analysis, but we're not going to be dealing with those ones for today because um, I just want to concentrate on these three key data analysis types. Okay, so with the first one, which has to do with predictive analysis. So this just has to do with predicting the future based on historical patterns. So more like what the machine learning guys and the whole, the, the core guys, what they do, the deep learning guys. So it's just basically predicting um, future outcome based on historical data and historical patterns. And so this speaks to what could happen. So if you see the question of what could happen, it speaks to futuristic. So we we'll look at the next one, uh, prescriptive analysis. So this just has to do with enabling smart decisions based on data. Now, this is kind of things like, what do we do? Okay, so we know what's going to happen in the future. What do we do about it? That's what the prescriptive analysis speaks to. And then for the descriptive analysis, it just speaks to data mining and providing insights to business. So with descriptive analysis, the data, um, the, the insights are readily available in the data. We just have to apply some form of um, statistics, or probably mean, median mode, uh, measures of central tendency and the likes of them to actually uncover some truth about our data set. So um, pretty much our descriptive analysis has to do with data that we currently have in the present. So it's just um, trying to get business insights from what we already have. What prescriptive just has to do with, okay, we have seen the future, but what should we do? And prescriptive, um, sorry, predictive analysis basically just helps us to understand what can happen in the future. All right, so what is data analysis? Now we're going to look at methods of data analysis. We're going to look at techniques and we're going to look at some of the tools that can help us in data analysis. Okay, so uh, pretty much here, data science is the process of extracting knowledge and insights from data by using scientific methods. Now, scientific methods can be um, statistical, it can be programming, it could be, it could just be business domain or business acumen. So it just basically speaks to, um, you know, trying to extract knowledge from data sets. Like I said initially, data in its original form is is unprocessed. It's in its raw state, and we cannot really do much with data because 90% or almost 99% of the time, we will never find data in the state that we want it to be. And so there's going to be some form of um, pre-processing, but we're going to get to that in the course of this session. Okay, so some importance of data analytics. All right, so the first one I just spent down here is um, to help to predict customer trends and behaviors. It helps to analyze, interpret, and deliver data in meaningful ways. Like I said, data in itself isn't entirely meaningful unless it has gone through analysis. And then also increases business productivity. It helps to drive effective decision making. And if you look at the picture on the right, um, which is the um, data analysis idea. So analysis kind of is like the catalyst between data and idea. So it helps to uh, provide insight for businesses to actually, you know, make decisions that can drive strategy and the likes of it. Okay, so key points in data analytics. 
Now, data analysis is all about, um, actually um, posted this once on LinkedIn, so I decided to just put it right here again. And uh, So it just says that data analysis is all about using data to create as much significant impact for your company, your organization, or an individual. Now, impact can be in the form of insights. It can be in the form of, of data product improvement. You could be looking to improve a product. You could be looking to um, initiate product recommendation systems. Yeah, so there are a lot of examples as well that you can actually um, get out of data. And secondly, the real job of the data analyst is to solve real life problems using data. Not to see how proficient we can be using tools and techniques. I think the major goal is to actually solve problems using data. And then lastly, being a good data analyst is not about how advanced your models are. It is about how much impact you can create using data. If you notice, I, I kind of capitalize the problems and I kind of capitalize the impact. So if you have uh, the ability to be, I mean, the, the potential to be a good data analyst is the ability to solve problems and be able to, you know, be impactful to your organization or to yourself as an individual or to, to your client, actually. Okay, so having capitalized the word problem, so we're going to be looking at some basic problem solving framework. Actually, there are actually two major um, problem solving approach to data analysis. So we're going to be looking at them. But first of all, let's just look at this image right here. Now, data analysis and problem solving skill sets. Now, let's look at the first guy. What's his balance say? They're saying you need to have some basic knowledge of statistics and probability. So in terms of statistics, I would say um, not so much statistics, but at least the use of um, I mean, main media mode, like I said, central tender, measures of central tendency, um, standard deviation, and the, likes, and the likes of them, and some probability as well. And then secondly, we'll have the visualization skills. Yeah, so the ability to actually, um, you know, visualize your data at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, you want to be able to present your data in a form that is easily understood and is readable to your stakeholders. And one thing about visualizations is that um, if you're going to build a visualization, it's only best that you, uh, you are able to communicate your insights um, into your data set within five seconds of viewing that particular report. Because I see, so I see a lot of uh, visualizations. They are really very colorful and they're really very, uh, you know, they're they are beautiful, I must say, but I mean, that's all we're looking for. We're looking for impact, we're looking for insight. And I want to be able to, you know, get that information that you're trying to present to me within five seconds of looking at your your data viz. And so the next one actually speaks to machine learning and algorithmic knowledge. I have to be careful pronouncing that actually. Okay, so machine learning actually just speaks to, um, I mean, most of the uh, data science um, techniques that um, that involves using algorithms like, um, you know, support vector. Uh, deep learning, um, machine learning languages, supervised, unsupervised learning, clustering and the likes of them. So I'm not going to go into that actually deeply. So I'm just touching base on that. So the next balloon here speaks to exploratory data analysis and data mining. So uh, one of the abilities and one of the um, approach to being a good data analyst is the ability to explore data as well and to be able to mine data. Basically mining data just speaks to the ability to actually uncover insights from data set and so the next one here is big data technology so this, so this is actually speaking to the uh, big data uh, more like the data engineers um, more like the Adobe uh, HDFS uh, map reduce Apache spark and the likes of them but I, I won't really you know do all of that for the sake of this session and then some programming skills as well programming skills like um, you know Java um, Python are and there's there's this new one on board actually Julia actually and I heard it's kind of nice so we'll get there someday. All right, so I'll move on to yeah. So one of the approaches to solving data analysis problems is the first one. They are mentioned there are two of them. The first one is called the cross industry standard process for data mining. That's the CRISPDM. That's the cross industry standard process for data mining framework. So if I we'll put them together in the next slide, yep. So I have this as the CRIS DM, so pronounced CRIS DM framework. Okay, so without any further ado, I'll just um, 
touch base on this, then I'm going to really um, touch on all of these segments um, as we proceed. But looking at this now, so we have the business issue to understand it. So the first thing about um, in a data analysis project or in a data analysis is understanding the business issue. So we have to learn to understand what does the what, what is the problem that the business is trying to solve? Because if you don't understand the problem, then I don't understand what you're trying to solve. So I mean, it's really very important to actually understand the business problem, which happens to be the first one. And then the second one, secondly, after understanding the business problem, is to now understand the data set that is required to solve and approach this particular problem. So which moves us to the second one, which is data understanding. So having understood this data, part of understanding this data is also collecting the data set as well, you know, and, um, and exploring the data set. And then which takes us to the next one, which is data preparation. So like I said earlier, we can never um, find data in the truest state that we want it to be. So it has to go through some form of um, preparation. It's just like the way we, we cook our meals. We can we can't, uh, we can't actually just um, get these things the way they are. So we have to prepare, get this, um, uh, what's it called? The ingredients in parts, and then we put them together, prepare them, and then we have a very nice, delicious meal at the end of the day. So that's the same process with data analysis as well. So data preparation. So now that moves us to the next one. After preparing our data set, we move on to doing our data analysis or data modeling. Okay, so having done our analysis and data modeling, we're going to have to validate our model or our analysis to see if what we actually got or what we actually um, did or the data actually, or the model, sorry, rather, actually fits the model that we have created. So we have to understand and to validate our analysis and our modeling techniques to actually be sure that we have actually achieved what we are trying to, what we're trying to achieve in the first instance, which is solving that business problem in stage one. And then finally, after validation, if it is found to be successful, we move on to the final phase, which is the presentation or the visualization. Okay, so I'm going to still touch down all of these one after the other. So I'm going on to the next slide. Okay, so this is the second approach to business problem solving. Like I said, the first approach is the Chris DM, and the second one is um, I call it the PMM, which is the predictive methodology map. So if you notice our predictive methodology map, the first thing that we have is the business problem. And now this is divided into two parts because the one to the left of your screen actually deals with predictive data analysis and the one to the right actually deals with non-predictive analysis. All right, so to the left, we have the um, predict outcome. And then below it, we have the data reach and the data pool. So I'm going to explain that. <clears throat> For the data reach, this actually says that we have rich data sets. We have data sets to be able to, you know, come up with a predictive model, which can either be numeric or a classification model. So we have um, basically two kinds. There are a lot of them, but I'm just going to stick to two types, two types rather, which are either numeric or classification. Numeric in the sense that um, I'm trying to, um, you know, do a predictive model that has to do with the continuous variable, for instance, price. How much are we likely to sell by next year? That's a numeric prediction. Is this person likely to buy a product? Yes or no? That is a classification. So classification just has to do with um, it's either binary or non-binary, like if you see below, it's either non-binary or binary meaning for binary is either a yes or it's a no. For non-binary, it could be uh, it could be a cat or it could be a dog or it could be a rat. It could be it, it's it's basically categorical. Okay, so now to the numeric side, it could be like I said, it could be continuous, continuous in the sense that it could be price. I'm trying to analyze price. I'm trying to um, I'm trying to predict the number of people who are actually um, likely to log into our website at a particular given time. So this deals with continuous variables. And then it could also be time-based as well, which is like the time series. 
Now below that are the tools and tech, uh, are the, sorry, I kind of like the approach to solving continuous predictive models, which are like the linear regression, the decision tree regression, forest model, um, decision tree, and the post decision tree. Um, don't 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 dwell on that. I'm just this is just um, just touching based on that. And then for time series, we have the ARIMA and the ETS. For classification, which happens to be binary or non-binary, we have the logistic regression or the decision tree. And then for non-linear, we can have the forest model, we have the boosted decision tree. We also have the support vector. We also have um, a naive bias and a couple of other stuff. So I'll move now. I don't want to dwell on that. So I'm going to just move on to the data core. Now, data core in the sense that we do not have enough relevant data sets to be able to come up with a predictive model. So because we do not have um, enough data sets to be able to come up with a predictive model, we carry out an experiment which is called A-B testing. A-B testing is an experiment that we carry out on, um, um, on predictive models that helps us to get data about what we need to actually be able to predict something about. So I give us a, an instance, um, for, for instance, um, a phone company. So, so I'm going to use Apple for an for example. So I, Apple wants to deploy a new version of an Apple phone. And um, now they do they don't have enough data sets for the new phone to actually make a prediction as to whether or not um, it's going to sell. It's going to hit make market share. Like it's going to really hit the market. So they don't have enough data set to be able to come up with a conclusion that this is actually going to be a successful product. So because of that, it is only fair that. Sorry, I'm trying to confirm. I'm sorry, can we still hear me, please? Hello? Yes. Sorry. Yes, my, yes, my yes, yes. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Loud and clear, man. Yes, yeah, yes. Carry loud on, and clear. Keep up. Hello, can we still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes we, we can. Responding. We can Hello. hear you loud and clear. Yes, yes, yes. I guess maybe his own headphone is. The, let me turn on my camera. The own network path is failing. We can hear you. Yes. Sorry, I'm trying to confirm if you can still hear me, please. Yes, we are hearing you. I guess it's you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can. We can. Uh, let me give him a call then. We can hear you. Apologies, I'm trying to reach him now. Uh, the... Yes, yes, okay. I was about to call you. Yeah, Maybe yeah, it's your yeah, headphone that is not letting you. So it's the reverse now. It's like you are the one not hearing us. So we've been hearing you clearly. You no know, no issues. Oh, really? Okay, so I can, I can actually hear you now. All right. All right. So okay. carry on. All right, thank you. Okay, so you can still see my screen, right? Yes, but you know you are on the Microsoft Teams, so we are seeing ourselves. <laughs> we are not seeing your Excel yet. I mean your Power BI yet. Let me let me let, let me just wish my password uh, my extended monitor kind of came back and I have to do some settings. Okay, okay, now we see we see the PowerPoint slide, sorry. Okay, you can see it now. All right. Yes. So I think I was actually talking about A B testing. So so I was giving a scenario about um Apple, yeah, trying to deploy a new product and uh, trying to see because they don't have enough data set to actually make a conclusion as to whether that particular new product is going to be successful. So they carry out an A B testing. Of um, to be able to gather data sets about that predictive model. So to the right, we have the data analysis, um, geospatial. Geospatial just speaks to locational data, collecting data based on location. Segmentation just speaks to um, grouping um, data sets into clusters. 
aggregation just has to do with basically, um, for instance, like I decide to say, I want to understand what is the count of people by this. So I'm just trying to aggregate my data probably by a count or by a sum. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly breeze through this guy here and um, come up back here to Chris. So I'm not going to actually talk about the predictive methodology map. Actually, I'm just going to dwell on the CRISP DM because this is actually an approach that is mostly Now, officially, we can't hear him. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have asked us, are we hearing him? Because it looks like he was predicting it. Hi, hello, sorry. I, I think I, I think I lost I, I was lost for a while. Oh okay. Sorry. Uh, is everybody back there? Oh I think this happened to everyone. It looks like the only thing reset. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you, maybe you can carry on. Well, did it was it for long? No, 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 just a very short time, just like um, ten seconds thereabouts. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry to uh, apologies then. It could be, I don't know what can cause it really. Okay, because it looks like everybody this time around. <laughs> okay, so I think you can carry on then. I think pretty much everybody's back. I'm looking at the meme. Uh, and I can see that we are almost back to the number it was. Oh, okay. All right, so can you see my can screen just, again? Yes, yes, we can. I can see the recording is still on. Yes. Okay, so let me let me know if I can proceed. Yeah, you can proceed, sir. All right, so I'm going to continue with the Chris DM framework. Um, so the first one, business understanding, data understanding, we've spoken about them. So I'm going to just talk about the comments on the outside of it. So for the business understanding, basically, um, this is where we understand project objectives. Uh, we understand the business objectives, try to gather business requirements and the likes of it. And then we'll move on to the next part, which is the data understanding. So this is where we do our exploration, trying to understand the data, collect our data sets, and also um, do our data selection as to what particular data set that we require to actually carry out that particular analysis or um, to solve that, that particular problem. And then the next part has to do with data preparation. Data preparation basically um, in terms of feature engineering. So feature engineering just actually speaks to creating uh, new entities from existing entities. For instance, like uh, we want to find out um, the ages of certain customers. Now we have their date of birth, and then we have today's date. So we can actually create a new column or new entity that says that today's date minus their date of birth, and we can get their age. We have created a new column. We have we've performed what's called feature engineering. So feature engineering just has to do with 
creating new features from existing features. So what we could decide to see um, a count of transactions of a particular customer. We are creating new features from an existing features about that customer that we already know. So I'll move on to the next one, which is the modeling. So this has to do with just um, to do with predicting potential customers using machine learning algorithms. So it can actually be uh, a machine learning algorithm or it could be a statistical or a database model. So it could be any kind of model. So this is not just limited to analysis. It could be um, a, a database or project. It could be whichever project we're trying to do in terms of data analysis. So that involves data. It has to be business understanding. It has to be data understanding. It has to be a preparation phase, modeling phase, and evaluation to be sure that uh, what we are doing is accurate or even to a certain degree. It doesn't have to be 100%. And then we move on to the last one, which is um, deployment. Deployment in the comment section there, we have like the UAT and the automation UAT, kind of like the user acceptance test. So like when we deploy our models, you know, and into our production environment, we conduct what we call the user acceptance test to be sure that um, it actually meets the use of, meets the needs rather of our end users or our stakeholders. Okay, so I'm just going to be touching based on, one of, on all of them, one after the other. Now, the business issue understanding, I'm going to start with that. Now, at this point, this is where we decide what decisions need to be made. What particular information do we need to make these particular decisions? These are the kind of questions that we you know that we have to think about while trying to solve, understand the business problem. So these are decisions that need to be made, informations that need to be, you know, that will inform these decisions, and also what type of analysis we need to provide the information that we need. All right, so to the next one, which is the data preparation phase. Okay, so I think I kind of skipped the um, data understanding, but basically the data understanding part just has to do with understanding the data sets, understanding how the data, the format in which the data set is being stored, understanding um, the basic data types. Are we dealing with integers? Are we dealing with, um, with floats? Are we dealing with categorical data? or continuous variables, like I mentioned in the past. So we have to understand the kind of data set that we are dealing with, and we have to understand also if the data is also required for the kind of problem that we are currently trying to solve. So that's really very important as well for us to consider in any data analysis project. So then to this point, which is the data preparation phase. Now at this point, we have we have certain, um, certain things that happens at the preparation phase. So. I think at this point, we might want to gather our data. So most times, 90% of the times, we would have our data set coming from different um, sources. So we might want to gather our data set from all the sources together. So after having gathered this particular data set from different sources, trust me, we're never going to get data that is clean. So we're going to want to go through that cleansing phase. And how do we perform this cleaning? We, we do by um, by removing missing values. So it could either be by removing a missing value, or it could be replacing the missing value. So we, there are different ways to handle missing values. Okay. So and then I go on to the next one. The data that we have might be in a format that we do not like, and we want to format it into a certain kind of form that we can actually work. Okay, and then, um, also we might want to blend some some joints with other data, and we want to you know blend and rotate the data set and do a lot of gymnastics with the data to be able to achieve your analysis. And then also we might want to sample the data in the sense that we might want to split that data into tests and um, um and train data sets. So we we'll probably might have too much of a data set and we do not want to work with all of our data. We might decide to pick out a sample of our entire data set to actually experiment and um, carry out the project with. So that's that on the data preparation phase. And then next on, we have the data modeling phase. So at this point, so it could actually be either, um, you know, data modeling in terms of uh, machine learning or it could be a database modeling. So like we have, for example, we have the hierarchical model, we have the relational model, we have the network model, object-oriented, and the likes of them. For hierarchical, I'm going to give us an example. I'm going to take that one as an example. 
An example of an hierarchical model is actually um, a date or a calendar to be precise. Now, we have a year in a calendar. Underneath a year, we have a quarter, a quarter. Underneath a quarter, we have months. Underneath months, we have weeks. And after weeks, we have days, we have hours, we have seconds. So this data set is kind of hierarchical in the sense that we can move from one point to another. They are all in the same entity, but they belong to different granularities. So it could also be an entity relationship model, like I spoke about um, columns being entities in the past, and I said, so it could be entity relationship in the sense that how does this particular column uh, relate to the column in the other table? So we're just trying to build object um, for entity relationship models and all kinds of models that we have here. So now from the modeling, we're going to evaluate, we're going to need to evaluate our model. Now in the first part, it says, in what way can the data be visualized to get the answer that is required? Now, how do we actually visualize this data to get the answer that we require, the modeling phase is all about? And then now in the evaluation phase, that's where we ask the question. Now, does the model used actually really answer the initial question? Does the model that we have created, does it answer the initial question or is it just there? Does it need to be tweaked? All right. Now, this guy here, the confusion matrix, this is actually, so I'm just trying to give an example of some of the ways that we evaluate models. So this is actually a predictive model. And the confusion matrix is actually an evaluation model. I'm um, sorry, as it's an evaluation technique that is used to evaluate our prediction uh, and is basically mostly applied to classification models. For instance, how likely is this person to buy our product? Now with this customer buy our product, yes or no? So the first box, which is a true positive, says that the customer was predicted to buy the product and yes, he did buy the product. The second part says false positive meaning the customer was predicted to buy the product. Meanwhile, he didn't buy the product. False negative. The customer was predicted not to buy the product, but he bought the product. Why true negative meant that he was predicted to not buy the product and he didn't buy the product. Please do not be confused about the formulas to the right. These are just um, ways to actually evaluate the model. So this is just the way of evaluating if a particular classification model meets its criteria. And we have certain parameters like we have accuracy, we have the precision, we have the recall, and we have one more, which is the F1 score. And those are the formulas that are, that are used to actually evaluate those models. Now here is, um, is an evaluation for regression models. I know that those terminologies may seem a little, so I'm not going to dwell on them. So I'm just giving an example of an evaluation of a model. Now, if you notice the, um, if you notice that curve, I mean the um, the wine color, which is, which happens to be in the 45 degree, that kind of which is random, that kind of um, describes what a random guess will be like. For instance, will this customer buy this product? Yes or no. If I take a random guess, that of what that I'm going to have my 45 degree line. So the blue curve here kind of um, signifies that it signifies how far away I am from a random guess, meaning that using machine to actually machine learning models and algorithms to actually make predictions is much more better than a random guess. So the farther away that curve is from the random line the more accurate my model tends to be. And the ROC curve there, actually, that's, that curve is actually, the blue curve is actually what we refer to as the ROC curve, which um, measures for sensitivity and specificity. 
Okay, so I'm not done, but I just wanted to break the session down into two. So I don't know if we have any questions as regards the first part. We can, um, you know, take out some time to deal with the question, and then I'm going to go into the next part. The next part, I'm actually going to look at the job roles and job functions in data analytics. So I don't know if we have any question. I, mean, I don't want to go too far to the very end, and then we have to forget our questions and come back again. So Mr. Michael, I don't know if you can help me out with that part. Um, I'm checking the chat box uh, and the chat area. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing any questions. Anybody has? Do you have questions? You can ask now. You can unmute. You can. Uh, any questions? Anybody? Okay. So maybe uh, as you sorry, go, I just want to. Ask. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Uh, maybe you can ask a question at the end of the. Okay, okay, we can have it at the end. Okay, okay so I'll just proceed then. Yes, and uh, we also look forward to you sharing the presentation slide with us, sir. Definitely. Okay, so I'll just proceed now to careers. Okay, so now data science is actually one of three things. Okay, so I think there is there is a lot of um talk and there's a lot of dispute around this topic. The truth is Data science is actually broken into data analysis, data modeling, which is data science, and then we have the data engineering. So these three um, job roles actually are entirely different while looking at the whole data analytics spectrum. So now the data analysis, so I'm going to talk on all this. So you're going to actually pick out um, for yourself where you feel that you have that your strength in and where you feel like you want to concentrate in because a lot of 90% of the time, uh, a lot of us don't know which particular one we want to do and we just keep learning and learning and learning and um, at the end of the day. Okay, so data science is actually one of three things data analysis, data modeling, or data science core. Data science core in terms of machine learning, and then we have data engineering. So turning uh, data analysts turns raw information into knowledge that can be acted on. So I'm just going to just quickly flip through all this. Using data, um, then the data modeling guy, he uses data that we have to estimate what we wish we had, which is basically to speak into futuristic. And then the data engineer, he's concerned with making everything work. So he's concerned with building data flow pipelines. He's not really involved in the data analysis project. He's just involved with building the data flow pipeline, um, building data flow pipeline, making sure that data is available when they when at, at when needed rather, and making sure that data is clean and is installed in the form that it is meant to be. So I'm going to actually just touch base on each of them now for the data analyst. What does he require? Domain knowledge. He requires domain knowledge to translate business needs to questions and make accuracy cost straight up. What I mean is just basically, um, you know, building, I mean, sorry, solving problems, rather, business needs and business problems, basically. Now, research. He knows how to gather the data, he knows how to design, he knows how to conduct experiments, experiments such as um, the very, um, you know, A-B testing I, I talked about and the likes of them. And then, so if we look at interpretation, he summarizes and aggregates data, and then he's the one responsible for data visualization, which are like the, I think the BI developers also fall in this category as well. And then he applies statistical tools to solve business problems. Um, the data science guy. Now, in this case, when I refer to data science, I'm referring to the data science core guys, which is the machine learning, deep learning guys. Now, they work with supervised learning. Supervised learning are kind of like classification models, regression models, anomaly detection, and the likes of them. For unsupervised learning, we have like clustering, we have dimensionality reduction, and also anomaly detection. I'm, I know we're going to have questions as to why anomaly detection is appearing two times. Now, some anomaly detections can both be a supervised um, um, model or unsupervised. 
Now, what do they mean by supervised and unsupervised? By supervised, it means that we have certain data sets that we can use to measure the outcome of our results. So, for instance, if I have data set and I have I have or probably um, 100 observations, I could decide to use 80 of them to to build my model, and then I use 20 of them to test. So at the end of the day, I have something to test against. But for unsupervised learning, we do not have data that has been in which we can use to actually and then we also have lastly the custom algorithm, algorithm development which has to do with feature engineering which I spoke about earlier and numerical optimization. Now the data engineer is um, he is a great data management person, database management, pipeline construction, data collection, he's great at things like this. In terms of production, he is an automation person, he's a system integration person, he helps to robustify you know, um, data management solutions and all. And then he also has some bit of software engineering skills and knowledge because he's basically working with, um, you know, big data technology and technologies and the likes of it. So we ensures maintainability, ensure that data is to scale and ensures collaborative development as well. Now there's a last one. And a lot of people don't like to talk about this one. This is the data mechanics. This is one aspect of data analysis, which I find really very, very exasperating. And we don't talk about this because this is where the, the work is, where you get your hands dirty, where you get to do type conversions, strict manipulations, trying to fix errors, you know, trying to manipulate data and time, um, cleaning missing values, like I said earlier. So this is where the data mechanics sits. Uh, querying, slicing, and joining data sets. Now we're going to look at this data analytics chart. Now, if you look to the left, we have the application developer. Now he has built some sort of software, either POS software or insurance software. Now the data engineer, his expertise in this is is that he is able to build the data flow pipeline from how data has been collected from this software right from login to data warehousing. So he collects the data, extracts the data, transforms the data, and loads this particular data set into a data warehouse, like you can see in the charts that we have here. And then to the top, we have a data analyst who require SQL and some Python or, or, or Excel to query this database, I'm sorry, or database or data Else, get some data from it, you know, do his analysis and report his insights either with PowerPoint or through data visualization tools like um, Excel or Tableau or Power BI. The data scientist, on the other hand, which is at the lower part of the end there, you know, he just he deals with uh, working with Python and R, you know, with statistical model to build models, futuristic models and predictions like um, you know, we could like let's take for, for, for let's take for example image recognition. Um, take for example, um, you know, sentiment analysis. Um, predict outcome of whether customers are likely to buy a product or product recommendation. So we have data scientists who build models that recommend products. Like for instance, the Netflix that you and I we all watch. You notice that when you watch a particular kind of movie, you start to see that Netflix is recommending some kind of movie to you. Even when you watch YouTube these days, you start to see um, recommended videos at the very top of it. So this is actually. Um, that particular part that deals with um, model creation and model building to be able to understand customer behavior and be able to recommend product and certain things to a customer. So they apply certain tools, tools like TensorFlow, um, SKLearn, and the likes of them. So now we're looking largely at the tools and techniques that the data engineer, the data analyst, and the data scientists actually work with. Now, the data engineer, like I said, he's a data warehouse guy. He views data flow pipelines. He works with big data, Adobe, Kafka, Spark, um, don't get carried with big words, um, SQL, MySQL, NoSQL, database like the MongoDB, 
the Python, Java, Scala. He works with ETL tools, SSIS, which is in here, Talent, um, Apache, the Earthflow, and SaaS, and the likes of them. So I'm going to share this slide because actually at the end of the day. And then for the data analyst, so he's an expert in Excel. So if you're an expert in Excel, trust me, this is for you. Um, expert in Excel, in VLOOKUP, working with pivot tables. Now, if you notice, SQL, statistics, Python, and ETL are asteric for the data analyst because they are not so compulsory a tool for the data analyst to possess. But when it comes to Microsoft Excel, enterprise BI tools like Tableau and Power BI, and then domain knowledge as well, these are really very important for the data analyst. And then also for the data scientist, as page of statistics, um, Python or R, okay, um, SQL. Now he works with environments like Jupyter Notebook, um, Spark, Tableau. Now he performs data cleaning and exploration using Pangas and Matplotlib and the likes of them, and machine learning, the deep learning as well, like extra learning and tens. So, and yeah. So, now I want us to do a quick one, just type in the comment section. So I'm going to look at this. These are the data science archetypes. We have seven of them actually. We have the beginner, we have the generalist, we have the diva, we have the detective, the oracle, and we, we have the maker, and then we have the unicorn. But I didn't have any space for the unicorn, so but I'm just going to explain who the unicorn is. So now I'll start with the first one, the beginner. Now he has some exposure in doing data analysis, he has exposure in doing data modeling, data engineering, data mechanics. He has the proficiency of MLA one. I, just has. I think we are still seeing your previous slide. Though. Okay, now it's showing. Sorry. Carry on. Oh, all right. So, like I said, the date, uh, the beginner, he has exposure of the data and of data analysis, data modeling, data engineering, data mechanics. No, not, not much proficiency um, because he's a beginner, obviously. The data scientist attacks the second one, which is the generalist. He has proficiency in data analysis, data modeling, data engineering, data mechanics. The diva, diva, the diva. Now he just has proficiency in data analysis, data modeling, and the data engineering. He doesn't want to get his hands dirty with the whole dirty work that the data mechanics guy does. Now on the detective, now this is where the data analyst actually has mastery because he's a, he's a detective. He always wants to find out what's wrong with the data, what is, what is happening. Okay. Uh, Small feedback, sir. You see that yeah. um, on the lower right side, we're showing Power BI office hour. Uh, so people are asking that if you can help us minimize oh. it because it's covering oh, 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 part oh. of the slide. Okay, okay. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. All right. Better now, right? All right, yes. Thank you. Okay, so the detective, he actually has mastery of data analysis, is exposed to data modeling, exposed to data engineering, and definitely he has to be involved in data mechanics because he has to be able to clean data, he has to be able to do so, those dirty work to be able to analyze data and get data to the form that he wants it to be. Now the Oracle, the Oracle is actually that guy who has mastery in data modeling. Exposure and data analysis, exposure and data engineering, but he also also has to gain proficiency in data mechanics. And then second to last time is the maker. He has proficiency in data engineering because he's the one who makes the pipelines, who builds data flow pipelines, the data warehouse um, and everything. So this is this is his own um, area. And then lastly, we have the unicorn. The unicorn actually has, I, I couldn't include it because I, I didn't have space. So the unicorn kind of is one who has mastery of all four of this particular um, data analysis, data modeling, data engineering, and data mechanics. But I'm going to tell you one truth. It is, it is possible, but entirely very difficult to find someone who is a unicorn because being a unicorn would mean that you have, I mean, it will be a lot of years, I mean, because these are different rules entirely. The data analysis, the data modeling, which is the data science core guy, the data engineering and data mechanics, these are these are rules on their own. So you have to have been, you know, it's going to take a lot of years, so you can hardly find um, 
unicorns because he needs to have mastery of all of these particular um, fields. Okay, so now next on now are the data analysis tools. So I mean, I, I believe we've talked about them in the past. Like we have the Microsoft Excel, we have the R, we have Python, we have SAS, Power BI, SQL, Tableau, there are a lot of them, Kafka, um, we have Adobe, Spark, MapReduce, and a lot of them, depending on what area of data analytics that you intend to, to focus on, whether it is data engineering, or whether it is um, you know data science core, or it is data analysis, or BI development. Okay, so I, I think I, sh I should, I, I, this is for me, is I think it's bonus. I, I shared this sometime on my LinkedIn, how to become a data scientist. So, and I, I stated that the first thing, I, I mean, which is really very important, is to do an internship. And internships are kind of like the best way to begin data science career. I mean, they're really very important because it gives you hands-on experience into facing a lot of business problems and challenges. Because so most times, trust me, working with um, Kego, working with on your own on personal projects sometimes it may not give you that feel of a real life problem because you might not face challenges of infrastructure so you're going to have a seamless model because uh, you're not faced with challenges of integrating with other applications you're not going to deploy to production and the likes of it so i mean internships are really very important in this particular career and then also learning sql sql is i, I must say is the most one of the most important um tools that is required to actually be a good data analyst, data scientist, um, even a data engineer as well. And then also learn basic statistics. I mean, I think I've emphasized this um, a lot. Learning programming or computer skills, well, it might not be entirely necessary, but if you are looking to be a data scientist, it might be important to actually learn these skills. And then good communication skills. I mean, effective communication is really very important, just like I have it on the right hand side, which are like the soft skills that are required for data analysis. You need to have an analytics mindset. We need to have numeracy skills, technical and computer skills, being attentive to details, having business skills and business acumen, and also effective communication skills These are very important because you have to be able to communicate your insight to the stakeholders who are non-technical. Trust me, you don't go to them and start talking about um, the standard deviation of something and something. So, I mean, you have to be able to explain to them in languages that they can relate with and understand. So, the graph down there just basically just speaks to the interjection, I'm sorry, the intersection um, of data scientists and all the skills that are actually required to be a data scientist. Okay, so I'm going to touch base on five myths of data science stroke data analytics that are actually existing which are not true which are not true rather but they actually exist and number one is that you need to have um computer science background for master's degree to be a good data scientist data analyst well actually um i must say that this is actually not true because i do not i do not have a computer science background i actually have an engineering background and then also you don't require a master's degree to be a good data scientist. I mean, there are a lot of data scientists, great guys out there who do not have a master's degree and they are succeeded and they're successful. I have a couple of people who come from even departments as such as English, from departments that you you least expect. Um, you know, people who come from political science and even law, you know, doing data science and are succeeded as well. So that's actually the number one myth. And then secondly, that data science is all about building machine learning models and artificial intelligence. And that's not true. Actually, data science is not just all about building machine learning models and artificial intelligence, except of course, you're talking about the guys who work in the data science core environment who actually deal with you know, machine learning and all. But data science in this real sense is not just all about building models and AI. There are a lot of um, other legs to it that other things that make up data science. Thirdly, you need to be very good at coding to get into data science. So that is absolutely incorrect. You do not have to be good at coding to get into data science. Trust me, you can survive as a good data scientist without coding knowledge. And these days, trust me, there's, there's Google, there are documentations. I mean, you don't have to really cram everything. You don't have to know, know it all. <clears throat> 
we have documentations that can help you to navigate your way into being an effective data scientist. The fourth one, learning tools is enough. Now, this is actually a problem. Um, a lot of people start their data science career by learning tools and techniques, by learning tools. You know, so somebody's asking, what tools do I need to learn? What tools do I need to learn? Do I need to learn these tools? And, um, you know, 90% of the time, people are distracted. Sometimes you go online and you see a lot of tools and um, a lot of things, especially when you're applying for um, a data analyst job, and then you see this job description where you see that an HR person has listed a lot of, of data analysis tools. Like you see, you see, I, I, I've seen um, data analysis um, applications that you see requirements like um, SSAS, SSRS, SSIS, you see um, Tableau or Power BI, you see things like Python and R and a couple of, a lot of them, you know, I mean, I think HR people also need to be educated about things like this too, because they just go online and probably just um, copy and paste job descriptions from online and just post it on their website and say, oh, we're looking for this. Most times, 90% of the time, they just need someone who can work with Excel. So uh, this is also me saying, when you see job applications like that for, for data analysts, I mean, jump on it. Sometimes most of these um, companies don't, they don't actually know what they're looking for yet. So I mean, just try to apply for as, as much as you can. Um, you might see tools that you're not familiar with, but be truthful, be honest, if, if asked actually, that you're not familiar with some tools and techniques, but work in your comfort zone, work with the tools that you're familiar with. If it is Python that you're familiar with, work with it. If it's R that you're familiar with, work with it. If it's Tableau, work with Tableau. If it's Power BI, work with Power BI. I mean, it's it's learning all the tools will not make you a better data scientist or a better data analyst. And then lastly, freshers cannot get hired for data analyst job. So, I mean, this is in line with the fourth one I just mentioned. Uh, based on the fact that recruiters, they want people with experience who have um, knowledge of probably 15 tools, even, you see them even list tools that probably just um, was introduced to data science probably some two years ago and you expected to have 10 years experience on tools that just came out probably last year. You know, so, so like I said, freshers can also get hired for data analyst jobs. It's, you just have to, you know, put yourself to it. It just takes a lot of you know, courage and the likes of it to actually get to that point. So these are actually the myths of data science. Okay, so I want to end with this quote that says that data is the oil of the 21st century. Actually, yeah, data is the new oil. And I'm sure that most of us may have heard this actually before. And analytics is the combustion engine hmm. by Peter Sondergaard. I love it this work. Okay, so we have finally come to the end of our session. And yes, I did my work now. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know if any questions, anybody have any questions at this juncture? Okay, so that means we'll just ask you the one question we ask everybody. Oh, Which okay. is? Someone's hand is up. Uh, so please, Damilola, yes, you can unmute your mic. Oh, awesome. Two hands are up. All right. Sorry? We are waiting for you. So there's a, someone Hello. has a question. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, I would like to thank our facilitator for today. We like the um, introduction and how he has been able to explain what it takes to become a good data analyst and all those things that revolve around data professionals. So my question today will be about the certifications. He didn't, he didn't talk a bit about the certifications that are required because when I saw his name, I saw the M, all those M's. What are the significance of all those certifications for a professional? That's my question. Okay, so thank you very much, sir. Um, now, 
on the regard of certifications. Now, first, uh, I think I, I think I spoke something about certification. I, I was in a webinar yesterday, and the, someone talked about the same certification thing. I think I gave my comment, and I'm still going to share the same comments. So, for certifications, now, first of all, what does certifications imply? What do they do for you as an individual? Certifications are meant to validate, validate your competence, or that you have well-grounded knowledge of a particular or a particular subject so certifications helps to help to validate that you have you know expertise in a particular subject matter now certifications are really very important they are sorry they are important and they are not important now why i say they are important and they are not important is, is, is the sense that you can actually you know build your portfolio you can build portfolio, work on projects. You can have a lot of projects, portfolios that you have, which you can use as um, a representation of, um, as a representation or replacement for certifications in terms of validating your skills. But why I said they are also good is the fact that um, there are certain companies or certain organizations of which you cannot get into without a valid certification. Also, the certification shows that you are you have invested a lot in yourself. So companies like um, consulting, who you know they, they practically build their clients based on the qualifications of the people who work on their projects. I mean, those certifications will be important to companies like consulting, but to other companies, it might not be entirely compulsory. But definitely, certifications are good. And so, what are the certifications in? Um, so I'll just give a few recommendations of certifications that are applicable in this area. So if you are if you are a Microsoft person, if you're a Microsoft person, I'll, I'll start with Microsoft. We have the Data Analyst Associate certification. So you made mention of what you saw on my profile, which is the MCSA. Now MCSA is actually the old certification. Um, actually, it still exists, but it has the name has been changed now to the Data Analyst Associate certification so i did mine um before the name was changed so the next time i'm going to do that exam because the, i think the certification lasts for about two years or so the next time i'm going to be doing it is going to be the data analyst associate so yeah so that is the data analyst associate which is very important which validates your skill in the use of power bi and excel and then secondly if you are a data scientist you can also go for the azure data scientist certification this validates your skill in the use of Microsoft Azure for machine learning. So it, it validates your skill in using Microsoft environment cloud um, platform for practicing machine learning. And then also if you're a data engineer, you can also take the Azure Data Engineer Associate as well. All these certifications are available. Then if you're an AWS person, AWS also have the data analyst um, certification. They also have the AWS certified um, big data engineer. We also have the um, AWS certified data scientist. So, I mean, there are a couple of certifications out there. And then um, for me, I think that we have the CBIP, which is the certified business intelligence professional for business intelligence professionals. Uh, we also have um, CAP, which is the certified data analytics professional. There are a lot of them, there are a lot of these certifications out there. I mean, they help to validate your skills and it helps you to belong to a particular community as well. So these certifications, when you write them and you know you're successful at them, you you get to be a part of a community that you can, you know, help to also, you know, add value to to the data analytics space. So I don't know if I was able to answer your question. Okay. So, uh, yes. So thanks. Uh, two other questions uh, one person wrote is and another i can see someone else's hand i can see your guy Debo's hand up so uh mr wally is asking can you elaborate on the tools used by each of the roles so the data analysis roles the data modeling roles you know, what tools do they use and what programming language will you recommend Okay, so I don't know if my screen is still sharing. I wanted to go to that. I don't know if you can still see yeah. my screen. Your screen is still sharing, okay. so you're on the team. So, so move it to another half. We'll see what you move to. Is this showing now? Can you see my screen? Can you see this slide now? Yes, now I can see this slide. All right. So I mean, this is the, this is that particular page that this that this particular person is asking about. So you can see here the data engineer because he works with data modeling and um, data 
data warehousing, the tools he'll be working with would probably be that, like if you're looking at the um, the big data space, working with um, the Adobe, Kafka, Spark, MapReduce, um, My MySQL, the MongoDB. He works with ETL tools because he's concerned with moving data from one point to the other. So he has to work with extra transform load tools like Talent, SSIS, um, Apache, um, the SaaS, and these are just common examples. There are a lot of them, but these are common examples of tools that a data engineer would work with. Then for the data analysts, we have um, like the Excel, and then we have Power BI, and then it requires domain knowledge as well. And then he requires some level of Python, like the Asterix, SQL, statistics, and the likes of them. And then for the data scientists as well, um, these are also the tools that will be applicable to the data scientists to work with. So. Okay, uh, so Mr. Debo, your hand is up, sir. Uh, I guess yes, you have sir. Oh, oh, sorry. I good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Okay, my question is you. Good afternoon. Um, sorry. Good evening, the lecturer. Please, sir. My question is that uh, during the presentation you mentioned um, doing internship, and um, I'm looking yeah. at how. How what are the how does that work for somebody like you know maybe you want like an added career you want to change over from where you are you've been in a, a a line of industry you want to either you want to change over or you want to have an add on so to speak at the same time you want to do an internship what is the structures on ground that you can do that and also I know about. Uh, let me just give this. I know about cargo or something like that. Can uh, yeah, there are there things you can do without necessarily being there? That kind of structure of internship, so that whether you are in Nigeria, you are not in Nigeria at, at any point in time, you can still do the internship. That's the new information I'm um I trying to ask. Thank you. I uh, okay. So I'm sorry, but I I didn't I didn't really quite. Understand like yes. the, the, ex, okay. yeah, the internship. The internship um, for somebody that wants to come into data something and that wants to do internship. Yeah. Where do where should that person turn to to look for internship opportunities? Uh, and possibly internship opportunities that maybe you can do um, virtual. Okay, so you, you're referring to like remote internships. Remote, correct. Okay, okay. Um, okay, that that that, that might seem a little not difficult, but I mean, I might not really have the information as to you know companies who offer um, remote internships at the moment. But I'm sure that um, I could do it. I could do some research around it because. Um, yeah, I know. I know a couple of companies who do physical internships. I mean, but as for remote, I, I can't. I can't really speak to that right now at the moment. Okay, thank you, sir. I will follow up with um, Oga Michael. Oh, all right, you're, you're welcome. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Luke. Mr. Luke, your hand is up. Yeah, Hello? Sorry, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah, we can. We can now. Oh, we are not hearing you again. They were just getting some static. Like cream, shin, 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 kind of uh, noise. How about now? Can you hear me? Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, now, my question is I'm going back to the last question the, um, the guy asked. I'm saying, without internship, is it I can't further a career in, in becoming a data analyst? Because if you look at most of us already, we have a whole lot of things. For example, um, I'm a preventive maintenance manager where I work. I just feel that I handle a whole lot of data. So I just feel let me learn more on 
data. So that is actually want to opt for at least let me have a good knowledge on data analytics. So, but trying to blend internship with it is going to be difficult for me. So I'm asking, without the internship, is there no way I can learn? Okay, so thank you for thank you very much for the question. Actually, definitely you can still be a data scientist without an internship. I never did an internship. Okay, so yeah, besides besides internship, I, so I just I, I I had to include the internship because I feel like um, it will give you that um, hands-on experience towards working with data sets. Do you understand? And really working with. So there, there are a lot of platforms out there. Like we have the Kego um, um, platform where you can actually do competitions. And there are a lot of hackathons out there that you can work on data, get data to work with. You know, there are a lot of environments that you can get data to work with. And, you know, without actually going through an internship. But I just wanted, I added the internship. So you probably have that um, first class feel of how it feels like to actually um, work in an enterprise, solving business problems. But so, but internships, trust me, like you said, your career, you're somewhere in your career already. So, and you're probably, you know, for, for those probably considering a career um, shift, you know, internships might not really be the best option for you, you get. But trust me, you can still actually be a good data analyst, data scientist, data engineer, whichever the case, without actually going through an internship. But being an internship, at, uh, doing an internship will actually give you first-hand knowledge and practice of things that you need to learn to get you started. All right, no problem. I just wanted to get clear. Yeah, yeah. You can still become one without an internship. Definitely. There is no one size fits all to this thing. There is no, there is no one way to it. People, people have different paths to becoming what they become. Some come from a different career and then delve into, in, you know, um, data analytics. Sometimes from the other, sometimes from the other, um, computer science background and the likes of them. So there's no one size fits all today. It's just, um, I think the major thing is just how much time you can give it and um, how much passion and how much you know actually give to it. So it just has to do with the interest and, and the passion. Okay, so. All right. So at this juncture, we will have to start wrapping up. And uh, so there are two things we normally ask everyone. So okay. question number one is uh, to tell us about your, your own personal story, how you got into this space, you know. Uh, how from not even, I don't know how far back it went for you. Maybe for you, it started at primary school. Uh, so we want to get. <laughs> <into that. laughs> okay, okay, so um, I mean, I, 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 I kind of like this story. So I started my. Well, first, I'll start with this. I, I have an engineering background. Yeah, so I'm electrical electronics engineering. So after my NYC, uh, I got a job at a at a power energy company, uh, which also you know kind of service. So um, I was actually sitting on a role that wasn't really interesting for me, and um, I don't know if um, if we are familiar with the knock knock word like network operation center where you just sit behind the computer, you you know just. Uh, event management and you're supporting technical teams and everything and all that. So it was really, you know, it was really very boring for me because I, I I was the kind of person who liked who liked to explore. I liked to, you know, I, I never like to do the same thing over and over again. I don't like to do the particular task the same way the next day. And so that particular uh, job role required that I would do the same thing over and over for a long time and so i met somebody i met somebody in that particular job who was a data analyst now i saw the way he was really valued i saw the way he was really very respected and you know they don't talk to him anyhow they don't they, they treat him like an egg he's a data analyst you know what i mean honey i i loved i loved the way he carried himself i loved the way his job was such that he wasn't doing the same thing over and over again he wasn't doing the same job function so i, I got i got close to him and I got close to him and I started to uh, started to learn. He started to show me little by little. I started from Microsoft Excel, then it was just Excel. I think that was in 2015. So I started, I learned, I started to learn from Microsoft Excel, you know, and then from Microsoft Excel, I went to Power BI 
<laughs> and then from Power BI, I decided to learn SQL. And then I, I took a lot of courses. I've, I've, I think I've taken more courses than I can remember in my life. Um, if I open my, my what's it called, edx, edx.org, Udemy, cross era and the likes of them, I've, I've, I've actually devoted a lot of time to taking a lot of courses. And I've, at this, this, this will really help you to actually, you know, become really very rich and give this content as a data analyst or a data scientist, data engineer. And funny enough for me, I, I, I can say that I've actually really, I've, I've actually touched base on all these areas of data analytics, which are the data engineer, data analyst, and data scientists, because sometimes you find yourself in an organization when, where it's just you, and um, you have to be the, the head and the tail of everything. So you get to do all these things and the likes of them. So I mean, being close to that guy then, um, back then, it really helped me to build myself in this data science career. This is why I talked about, um, um, so in the place of internship, you can get a mentor. So he was like a mentor for me. So I had mentorship from him because for, for me, I had guidance. I had somebody who could tell me, um, this is the next course to take. This is the next skill you need to take. This is the next skill you need to get. So I, I wasn't just going over into the internet and just picking things out at random. You know, I had the right guidance. I had somebody telling me, well, this is it. This is this, this is that. This is what you need to do, you know? And I feel like if you have the right guidance, trust me, because nowadays there are a lot of buzzwords on the internet. You know, you can really go onto the internet and you're seeing a lot of big words and you don't understand what it means. And sometimes you see some free scholarships and you want to jump on it. And sometimes you're not ready for that kind of knowledge or for those kind of skill. And then you get tired and exasperated and you just give up on this, on the, on the career path. And you're like, hey, this is not for me. But not, it's not just that it's not for you, it's just that you didn't have the right guidance or you didn't have and um, take your time to learn the things little by little. So I, I feel this was something that I did and, um, you know, I had the right guidance and I and I listened to my to my guide, you know, how it taught me to really bring myself up to speed. And I feel, I feel like that's really very important towards being um, a good data analyst in the future. Thanks a lot for sharing that personal, uh, your, your own journey. And I'm sure some people are taking some, uh, maybe finding some nuggets of what they can follow to from it. So I, the last one is, um, so over your, these uh, many years you've been in this space, you know, what is the one thing that has happened to you? What is the one experience you've had it could be a positive experience, it could be a not so pleasant experience, but the one thing that stands out among all the things you've experienced in this space, it could be around a job, it could be around an opportunity, it could be around uh, something that something someone else maybe got and you wanted, or like something that on a, on a LD on an emotional level that it was kind of, it stands out, you know, as an experience in all these your many years in this space. What's that thing that, you know? Wow, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, as you mentioned it, the question, I was just trying to think of which one to pick because there are a lot of them in my head. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me let me let me give um let me I think I just tried to pick this one out. Okay. So this is um. At my current company, some some two years back, yeah, so I think when I joined the company, when I joined the company um, sometime, I we didn't have I mean we didn't have like a data warehouse, and so we had conversations. We had a conversation with a third party vendor to to implement. Um, okay, not really a data warehouse, like a data mart, an MDM master data management solution. So, which will require a lot of data engineering techniques, SSI, CTL, and the likes of it. So, um, I mean, we, we had this conversation with the third party vendor. So, they came and actually, you know, decided they brought in their bid to actually um, do the project and the likes of it, um, brought in their cost and all. And then one day, while sitting on my chair, I said, ah, this project that we are paying these people for, actually, is not something that will be doing small, small. 
So, I mean, I started to, and then I remember, because remember then my boss didn't actually, believe, didn't actually believe that it was that one person can actually do that. Yeah, I know, obviously it's possible one person cannot do that, but it will take a lot of time for one person to do that. So, well, in my own very seat, I, I would just, um, at close of business, I would stay back and I would, and I would work on this project and I'm working on this thing, and I'm working on it. And I'm working on it until somebody came one time and said, ah, is it not this thing that I want, want to pay people millions for that you are doing. I said, ah, is it all, but my boss does not believe that one person can do it. And the person said, you know what, continue. When you get to a particular point, I will personally go and meet myself and say, this thing that I want, want to spend money for, you are doing it already. So I kept on doing it a couple of times until it got to a point. You know, you know, you know how the measure milestone, you're, you've gotten to a point where, ah, no, this thing is very possible. It's, it's maturing. So he went and spoke to my boss, and my boss was like, oh, really? Okay, no, but you have my blessing, continue. You know, at that point in time, and, and I, at the end of the day, I was able to finish it, and and actually the vendor got back to me. The vendor got back to me, rather, because um, he had a personal conversation with me, and he got back and was like, hey, guy, I heard that uh, somebody had done it. And I said, well, actually, it wasn't really about that. I wanted to do your job. I just wanted to get my hands dirty and do the job. So for me, it was really very, it was a very emotional state for me because, you know, at that point, I, there was this thing with me and the vendor, you know, I, I can't really say sure actually, but, and there was, there was a, there was a past, I had a past with the vendor. It was a good past, actually. I had a, I had a past history with the vendor. I'm not going to share it, but that's a personal thing. <laughs> I'm not going to share it here. But yeah, so that was that was something for me. That was one big thing for me, and that was that was actually the uh, one of the biggest challenges I ever faced. Because I mean, some some days of the week you end up you end up trying to troubleshoot just the connection to an oracle to oracle. Like I mean, you'll be trying to solve one particular problem for a whole week. I mean, that was like one of the longest years of my life, and um, I mean, I'm grateful that it came to an end finally. And that that was a good experience for me actually. With so, but then let me. I'm sorry if you allow me to share one negative experience. Actually, yes. <laughs> so one negative, yes. experience. yeah, one negative experience. So I can remember, which is why most times I always talk about that data visualization is not about colors. It's not about you know. As we grow up, we we keep maturing. At my very early days in building data visualizations, you know, I once built a very nice report. To me, I felt like this report was really very fine. Was really very nice. You know, I had all the colors and everything down. And then when I sent it to um, to my manager, and the next mail I got was, "What is this? Are we? Is it the color that? I mean, the mail there specifically talks about. Is it? The, is it the color? Is the colors the value? You know, do you know, you know how the ground wants to open? because people were copying. You understand? You know how the ground was open right. and swallow you. Yeah, the ground was open and swallow you and you feel that oh my God, this thing that I took in all my time to do and I worked so hard for, you know, at the end of the day, just got rubbish like this. Ah, oh my God, you know. So, I mean, th that was really a very negative thing for me and it really helped me to really go back to the drawing board and what does visualization really mean? What does it say? What does, I mean, sometimes some negative things bring out the best in you and that was one of those negative things that brought out the best in me, actually. So negative things are good, trust me sometimes well because you took the learning from them anyway because if one doesn't learn from them you know it becomes really like worst of two worlds so uh, yeah it's definitely very, it's been a very great one a nice session with you and uh, we are very happy that uh, even though we let me see you know, we've used like one hour 39 minutes but people didn't complain they stayed back and I can see the number is still, you know, a good size of the maximum we have today. So that means people are enjoying your session and that means they've gotten value. And so I want to say thank you for this opportunity and to our participants to a very big thank you because uh, we are not taking it for granted. You know, it's you are not paying cash, but you are paying in time. And for some of you, that time is even a lot more than whatsoever if this was a paid event that you would have paid. So. Obviously, you are paying one way or the other, which is your time. So we thank you for deciding to spend time with us and we hope you join us again.
next week. So next week, uh, I think we have, I'm not so sure if there's a guest for Power BI, but uh, there is a guest for the financial modeling and the and the Excel. And in two weeks time, let me just see if I can pull out for you and share on my screen so that you can see the guest list. We have Matt Hallington. Uh, he's one of the people whose books helped me a lot. So I managed to grab him and uh, we have him for, let me just see if I can pull up the records. So it would be a nice, and if you know anybody we need to invite because these days uh, it's becoming one-sided. I'm the one fishing out people to invite. So uh, I think, okay. uh, yeah, mortality is February 28th. So you can see I have a lot of slots that I haven't gotten people for here. Yeah. Seems the Excel and financial modeling is it's getting a lot of people. Uh, so please, if you have anybody you want us to recommend, people you know within your circle who we can benefit together from their knowledge here, please. Yes, you know, there's no... Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yes, I'll reach out to you. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm, I'll be very happy because as you have said, you know, the things that might be missing might not even be the big things because sometimes some people feel they must have been like, maybe they are gods in the thing before they talk about it. And I think it's common for us in Nigeria. We try not to want to talk about things until we feel like we are we are already popular for it. No, no, dear, we are too. I, 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 I think I had that syndrome. I think I had that syndrome for a very long for a very long time. I, I refuse to do anything like this or talk or even post it on LinkedIn until I think until probably I think until like last year <laughs> that I started to become really very active. And, and, and I'm sure the little you've been doing in between then and now, uh, people are getting value from it. Maybe if you read the comments or some things you will see. And so that's the thing. Look at what you've done today to uh, a lot of value. So imagine maybe, uh, in fact, we should try and get you more sessions so that you don't lock those knowledge in. So that's why I'm also asking if you know people too, who they are also not wanting to like we say now the nigerian factor maybe they also too are not wanting to push themselves out into the speaking uh environment you know as technical guys sometimes we lock ourselves up trying to to do the work rather than speak but we need to speak to not just for your sake but for the sake of like the community and yeah. i guess that also to brings out the best in us so uh I'm just pleading. It has got to that level that I'm asking for volunteers among those and <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> so thank you once again, Mr. Ephraim. We we'll definitely want to have another session with you in the future. So it's just a matter of maybe I'll chat you privately to ask when you might have time for us again. No pressures. Uh, and since okay. you see you also have people you may recommend, I'll be very glad. So thank you. And uh, thanks and to thank everybody. Thanks to everybody as well too, for being a part of this. Have a nice week ahead. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Bye.